I as one personally, I think, is really a, a challenging question. It's more challenging than it seems because it really causes you to have to look at yourself. And, um, and as I've thought about transformation and leadership uh, in a, any organization, certainly true for the church, um, I think one has to have an experience of love and caring in your own life, whether it came formatively, you know, as a child, and I know that a lot of people haven't been blessed with that kind of experience as children, but somewhere along the line, one has had to come to know the reality and the experience of being cared about and being cared for and being valued as a human being. Uh, again, goes back to my childhood. I grew up on a, a dairy farm, um, and um, dairy farmers are seven-day-a-week people um, in terms of the work life. Um, it was, uh, my parents were religious people, churchgoers, so they honored the Sabbath as much as you could at a dairy farm. The cows still needed to be milked. Oh, but, um, you know, Sunday was their day off, but often what my parents did with their Sunday, even though it was like uh, the only time they had off, uh, was go visit some elderly members of the church. Mm. Um, and, you know, as I thought about that in terms of, you know, how that's influenced me in terms of anti-racism work, it really, you wouldn't call going and visiting elderly people as acts of justice, but it, it has the same thread in that it, it poses the question, who's included and who is excluded? In this case, there are elderly folks that couldn't get to the, back to church that were being excluded. Um, not because of anything anybody is doing, but be, because of the way life was for them. I bring that same kind of um, question, I guess, into the anti-racism work. And so, you know, I think about that kind of formative experience. I look at it in terms of uh, a broader picture of, you know, race and fairness and justice here in our own nation and beyond. And the question, once you start asking the question, who is included and who is excluded, and then start asking the questions of why is it that way, um, you find yourself, as long as you keep asking those questions, um, on, a, on a journey that you really can't stop. Uh, you just have to keep following where those questions in the Christian tradition, for example, the language of being born again, that's been narrowed in you know, a lot of sectors to mean something very, in my judgment, small. But really, it's about transformation. It's about you know, being born into a new life, a new way of seeing things, a new discovery. That's what anti-racism work is about. Um, in the Christian tradition, one talks about dying to an old way of life and rising to a new way of life. These are powerful metaphors for change and transformation. Um, you know, those are kind of personal. And then in, the, in our tradition, we also have the metaphor of uh, the kingdom of God or the realm of God. Um, and, you know, which is come, you know, the Lord's Prayer that's offered in most churches every Sunday. When one unpacks that stuff and takes it seriously uh, and doesn't just become stuff that you're repeating, uh, it is really about change, social change. It's about a justice movement. Uh, and it's about transformation on, on a big scale. So one thing that's been important for me is uh, continued commitment to my own growth and learning. Um, I don't think I can be an effective leader if I don't continue that process. Mm -hmm. um, and I have continued to discover, you know, those things that I was absolutely unaware of uh, and continue to be surprised that, I, you know, being a part of, you know, anti-racism work and being on that journey has given me um, more courage than I would otherwise have. Uh, and that's been uh, manifest in a couple of ways. I, um, I have a lot more courage in terms of being engaged relationally with people of color. I think a lot of white folks, uh, and I would have had to include myself, have an innate anxiety about engaging with people of color. I, 
I am mindful that I, it's not about earning you know, uh, merit badges for your good work in anti-racism. Uh, I can't bring that with me into a new relationship and say, here, look what I've done. Uh, every new engagement, every new relationship starts is a fresh start. And whoever I'm engaging with, they don't know me from anybody else that they other white guy that they've encountered over you know their lives and and so that's where I have to start and that means I have to start with uh, a good deal of humility and uh, you know openness in this situation but my own preaching is certainly ref reflective of anti-racism commitment um, you know it uh, it it's a lens it's a lens through which I uh, come to sacred texts and uh, the dynamics of, uh, you know, our sacred text, scripture, uh, it, the, the story of empires and, how, and injustice are all through that, from the Hebrew scriptures into the Gospels. And so once you begin to understand a little more clearly the dynamics of racism, it's not hard to understand the intersections between the dynamics of you know, empire and injustice and how that played out, you know, thousands of years ago and how it continues to play out today. Anti-racism work, in my judgment, is not for Lone Rangers. It's for people working collaboratively and collectively. And so if one wants to be serious about anti-racism work, one has to be serious about forming community and building community. And again, you can have a you know, religious expression of that as a church community, you can have a secular expression of it, some other types of communities. But being in partnership and being in collaboration and having a support network, I think, is vital for anti-racism work. It just can't be done alone. Um, and that's not just a strategic question of numbers, but it's really a question of uh, internal support. It is really walking into the difficult and painful stuff of life. And so in order to do that uh, and not become discouraged and depressed and, and give up, you need a community of support. What is, inspires me is having been born in uh, Mississippi in 1943 okay. and um, watching uh, the as I grew up um, watching the treatment of my family, treatment especially of my father. Mm -hmm. um, my father was this big, tall man, you know, who um, just was treated so awful in so many places. And so as his daughter, as I watched this, um, one experience in particular was I watched as he was spit on by this white man who he worked for. And I watched my father. I remember watching my father because the man, I, even at that young age, understood that the rage and hate that would have had to be inside of him to make him do this yeah. to someone like my father. Um, even at that age, I could understand that. What I couldn't understand was that my father stood taller and took his huge uh, protective hand, put it on my head as I was this little girl, and we walked. It's kind of like when you hold someone's hand. Right. Well, he put his hand on top of my head and turned me, and we walked away. And he never said a word, but the energy that he really transmitted to me from that experience has left me with a better, greater, deeper commitment to um, mastery of myself. So I wanted to understand how the inside, how his inside, how the uh, mechanisms for coping strength. gave him that strength, exactly. So what I tried to do in uh, creating the cultural wellness center was creating an alternative, which meant we had to deal with transformation and becoming. How do you change? Move from one. Yeah. How you move from one stage to another? How do you um, ground 
your vision of change from I want things to change to I want things to change to a better and more um, uh, deeply, uh, what I say, spiritual and cultural way. The way of knowing, the way of thinking, the way of producing something different, if it's transformational, it has to come from something different than what the racism that we're fighting came from. In other words, you can't solve the problem and you can't create transformation out of the same thing that produced the kind of Mm -hmm. um, strategy and hatred hatred that we are trying to transform. You have to have an alternative. So I think that's what my work has been about, um, that culture has to include spirituality. So it has to. It can't. If the, if spirituality is not present, then culture is not present. So language and values and customs and beliefs that come from a spiritual ground um, is what we try to put we put in place, and we see it play out in the classrooms with the children that we work with. We see it play out, um, particularly in African with African American children that we work with, um, where children are. Um, expressing a level of uh, frustration and rage and um, what where does that come from at age 7 10 and 12 and what we're really beginning to see is that it comes from uh, the the lack of capacity again to express what they are ha- what's going on inside so if you think about what spiritual uh, values are. They are more internal. So what we try to do is to say, let's tell us what's happening with whatever words you have, and that then will tell us what, what, what's happening in your spirit. And we try to really teach the children and work with children and show them that uh, uh, deeper levels of thinking and deeper levels of um Imagining something different mm. um, will give them the capacity to once again transform any situation they're in. So as we teach cultural, um, we teach cultural classes. So that means that we, um, in the classroom, we expose children to once again those things that culture brings. So what does language bring? Uh, having them think about their language, their think about their people and think about their family system, their community, um, and think it through and say, what is it that you get from this family? And in many cases, if it doesn't feel good to the children, then we say, what would you create if you had the opportunity? What, what, What would you create, right? What would be the alternative to that kind of sadness. And it's an amazing experience to watch the children come up with things that um, we think comes from the internal uh, kind of process. And this work that we are doing is anti-racism work. Uh In other words, it is, uh, it's the alternative to, yes. It's the alternative to what currently exists that we can't fight things and replace them unless you have something to put in their place. And so that's that's the approach that we're using at this point. We have practitioners and clinicians and whether they're educators or as I said, healthcare providers who come here to relearn a way of living and being that does challenge the institutional practices that are, are racist and are judgmental. And um, and so our approach part to of the it, structures. Is, right? it, yeah. Our approach to it is that people, individuals, this personal transformation has to start from the inside out. And no matter where we work, and no matter what position we hold, we are a part of the problem. And now we must together become a part of the solution. Let me let me tell you how I got into healthcare. You know, so I read uh, Michael Harrington's book, The Other America, back in 1962 when I was in high school, and it said. There were 40 to 50 million people in this country that were really not benefiting from the American dream. And they were basically the poor and the people of color. And that really struck me. And when I read that book, and then I realized over the next several years that John Kennedy also had read that book, and he developed this war on poverty. 
well, he started it and Lyndon Johnson carried it on, and that it was making a huge difference in communities, particularly communities of color. And that resonated with me because where I grew up, we didn't have any people of color. And I was really interested in, in what was going on uh, throughout, the, throughout the states and seeing the changes that were made and knowing that, that this world was much bigger than, than what I was seeing in my little hometown. So that sort of stuck. When, when I was eight years old, my dad took me to a Green Bay Packer game. And that's when I saw the first African-American in my life. And his name was Bobby Mann. He was a, a, a running back for the Green Bay Packers. First African-American I'd ever seen. And I asked my dad about that as we were walking home. And he said, yeah, he can only come into town during the football season. And he then needs to leave when the season is done. And he can't live in town. He has to live on the outskirts of town. And I reflected that to my dad, that, that doesn't seem fair. And my dad said, no, that isn't fair. Uh, so I'm hoping that your generation actually does something about mm -hmm. that. So that was sort of an, a, a seminal point where I had to really think about, oh, there's some expectations that my generation maybe can do something to make things better for a lot of people. So that was certainly one you know, particular incident. Uh, but certainly as, as I became Commissioner of Health, and we started asking folks around the state what creates health and recognizing that many populations uh, particularly of color and American Indians, are not benefiting from all of the benefits of the state, it really became clear that uh, we needed to really address health equity in a really proactive way. Just looking at the data, looking at the pain that people are under, uh, looking at the situations that people don't really have any opportunities to be healthy. They're in situations where they're uh, really refrained from benefiting from all of the things in our state. We've been working with, even before I became health commissioner, you know, we were really working with communities about how to create health and how to deal with disparities. But becoming the health commissioner gave me a, a platform to, to really take it to a different level and get some visibility on this issue. So we developed the Advancing Health Equity Report, which identified the fact that disparities are a huge problem in this state and that they're really not about access to medical care and personal choices. It is really about the social political climate, the socioeconomic climate that people are in. Uh, so we said, if we're going to really be a healthy state, we've got the best medical care system in the country. Mm -hmm. We really overall are a very healthy state on average, but we have these huge disparities. That have, and as our population is changing, unless we really address those disparities, we'll not be able to maintain our status as a healthy state. So in order to do that, we have to deal with health equity. And the, the issue that most people don't want to talk about is, is race uh, and the disparities we have in race and the, uh, the lack of opportunities that people of color and American Indians don't have because of some of the policies that are in place that have been put there many, many years ago but are impacting them negatively. And so we decided that that's where we would lead. We would lead with the discussion about race as one way of getting at all of the policies and the systems that benefit whites at the expense of people of color and American Indians. Well, certainly when, when, when we were looking at the, the Central Corridor light rail, they did not pay attention to the people in the middle of that line, particularly people of color in the middle of the line, low-income folks, where there are no stops. And really to see the community come forward and say, you know, we're being disadvantaged by that policy that says you have to move people as rapidly as possible you're paying attention to only one criterion. That's the efficiency of it. You're not paying attention to the population needs. And so with their advocacy and their organizing and their really uh, creating a movement, they were able to get three stops. Not only that, they actually changed federal policy on uh, how to evaluate transportation, things like the, the Central Corridor Light Rail. It really reflected that it's the power of communities coming together uh, to address policies that really disadvantage some. <clears throat> uh, income is a huge issue. So we developed a report on income and health. And from our studies, it really showed that if you increase somebody's income from the lowest 20% up into the next category, you actually could increase their life expectancy by about three and a half years. That, that little bit of investment at the low income level is really, really important for, for health. Uh, that it says that we have to take an approach that is broader than what we traditionally have done in the health department. So we're taking now at the health department a health and all policies approach where we really say we need to partner 
with transportation and housing and economic development and corrections uh, as a team to create the conditions in which people can be healthy. But do it with a health lens. How does it actually improve health? And with a health equity lens, how does it reduce disparities and how does it advance health equity? So that when you know, the Department of Transportation is building a road, how can we make sure that everybody in the community can benefit, that it actually enhances health as opposed to uh, detracting from health? How does it build the capacity of those communities, build the opportunities in those communities, those opportunities for health? Because we know that if everybody benefits, as Paul Wellstone said, everybody benefits. And, um, and, and we know from the data that the, if we can reduce the income inequality, everybody's going to get healthier, even the people at the top. Uh, so if, if deed and economic development rec look set economic development through uh, that equity lens and that disparity lens, uh, I think we're going to have a really healthier state. And it'll be because everybody's doing it together. And a lot of it's personal stories of things that I've learned or where I am and what I'm learning from a conference that I'm going at and, and some of my reflections on that. And I recognize that when I tell a story that reflects about something I'm doing, people often open up and are willing to share a little bit about what they're doing or they reflect on the same kind of thing from a little different angle. Uh, it's, you need to be open, a little vulnerable to, to sharing a little bit about your personal story um, and people will share back. My name is Maria Isa. I am a singer, songwriter, actress, activist. I feel that the inspiration of my work definitely started at a young age from uh, the movement working alongside, or I, I say working alongside, um, but being around my mother, who is human rights is still a human rights activist and advocate for women's rights, and showcasing how how far we've came as people of color, however, how much more work there is to do in my generation. Um, growing up around uh, people in power as far as politicians, as well as the people who volunteer to make sure that our voices are being heard. Let's not look at the color when we're talking in a circle. Let's talk about the issues. And then we can bring in the color, and you'll see the statistics there. And that's how we can move forward. And if people are neglecting the fact that there's that racism doesn't exist, uh, they're tripping. <laughs> I'm gonna say they're tripping. Let's read the headlines. Let's see how much negative is being written and not the positives that are being told about people of color. Our main goal is to unite, not to divide. Our main goal is to educate because we live in a world where, like I said. History is not being told how it's how it's how it's came. We can't be figuring it out that we live. In, we, everybody wants us to live in a Disney world, and it's not going to happen that way because we obviously know that there is pros, there's cons, and a lot of the cons are the evidence of the racial barriers that are placed. It's about learning more a little bit about ourselves and being able to engage in conversations with people who may not want to even hear it, but enforcing that. And those hashtags and those tags and those tweets are what enforces that. If you have 13,000 people retweeting something regarding the video that's happened or a movement that's escalating behind uh, health rights or the DREAM Act, those, that's a momentum that boosts that energy. However, it's not just retweeting it. Let's take it out and like I said, let's talk about it. Let's have a circle. You don't have to be a musician or a professional. You have it right here in your soul, in your heart. And everybody knows it's right, and everybody knows it's wrong. I think I feel like I was born to be an artist. Um, it wasn't to say I want to make movies right now, or I, I can do. It was more like I can do it. Um, it's just a natural feeling. I don't. I, it's kind of interesting. I'm sure pretty all artists can feel the same. You do it because you're passionate. There's a difference. Some people do it thinking that there's a big ticket or a big Lamborghini waiting for them outside. Or the activism part is something that I learned um, that I had to do when I seen so many issues happen to people, to myself, and utilizing the art um, to be able to express to people maybe don't want to hear it. I grew up going to school with, you know, people who their parents were racist, you know what I'm saying? Uh, did not want me to bring up 
the issues that we overcome or did not like maybe who my mom and, and I were attending their, their political <laughs> campaigns. And, and I try to take away like the, the political stance of who to endorse. I'm more about who's speaking my story and who feels and who's actually out on the streets working with it. That activism part came about saying, I mean, I was probably 11 years old and that's at the time when I recognized I can make a difference. I don't have to go that route. I don't want to be a statistic. I want to go ahead and try and make sure that those who are blindfolded to see that they're going to be in the statistic, I want to help them take that off. I want them to know that we have a right and whether you want to be in medical school, in law school, everybody has a, a power and a force. Whether you want to create and design shoes, I mean, we all can work together and find and fuel a better tomorrow for children and people of color. If I can inspire my grandmother who's 95 years old to think a different way from her values, you know, 80 years ago, it, um, it's like hold a globe in your hand. Look at the world. See, yes, it's big, but recognize how small it is and recognize how much you can leave an effect on it if you were to interact with so many different people and create positivity. I have a song called Steve Jobs. Okay. Oh, sweet. Right. It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty deep, so, but fun. La sangre llama no lo puede negar. La historia de los esclavos no se puede olvidar. Cada día trabajamos, tienen que respetar, tienen que respetar, tienen que respetar. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, took all the jobs, locked up the mob, paid off the cops, poisoned the crops, put us in a box, and we're still dying from pork chops. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, career sabotage, burned down the mob, set fires to the fires, raised up the cops, gentrified the block and put a hope in the Bronx. The economy's a wrap, the ghetto is a trap, the president is black and the mayor's smoking crap. Even though the war is all about the poor, can't afford time for, can't ignore ride for. Record labels won't even pay for your tour. The devil wants more, the devil wants more. East 94 with my pedal to the floor, thinking about little bevel blood sugar 94. I know they got it pure, but they want to keep it hidden, secret. I get it, I need it. I'm at the mall, 30 milligrams of Adderall. Welcome to the Valley of the Dogs. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, took all the jobs, locked up the mob, paid off the cops, poisoned the crops, put us in a box, and we're still dying from pork chops. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, career sabotage, burned down the mob, set fires to the fires, raised up the cost, gentrified the block and put a whole food in the Bronx. Step up to the drum, one green cigarette, three shots of rum. Some say you're crazy if you speak in tongues, sign of the cross from the nun, but I could be healed by the stars and sun. Said I could be healed by the stars and sun. Snowden on the run, I hope he has a gun. Cause when Popo come, they poke a hole in the fun. Puerto Rican rum poured out for big pump. Rub up on pump, tuku tuku thun thun. Black lump punctured hole in my lung. But wars being won by the songs that are sung. The wars being won by the songs that are sung. The wars being won by the songs that are sung. La sangre llama no lo puede negar. La historia de los esclavos no se puede olvidar. Cada día trabajamos, tienes que estar, tienen que respetar, tienen que respetar. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs. My name is Leon Rodriguez. I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Well, I, I think the first thing is um, I share a legacy with many other South Africans having lived under apartheid oppression in South Africa. And I moved to the United States after South Africa's political settlement just to find that in the United States people still struggle with race, people still struggle with oppression, people still struggle with discrimination. And I work in an organization where I think we deal with a lot of the residual effects of that era of racism, of segregation. And uh, we need to transform our organizations to be inclusive, to uh, value and validate the presence of those whose value may at some point in history be questioned um, or even subjugated. And our organizations need to be more inclusive of that. And our organizations need to be more inclusive of that. 
So when you talk about transformation, I think it starts off with ourselves. We are born human if we prefer to believe that, but there are processes in society and the way society has been socially constructed that tell us we are less human. For example, um, we could not vote. We, never, we were disenfranchised. Um, we could not apply for the same jobs as everybody else. We could not live in certain neighborhoods. Um, there was a time we could not even get education, which meant that we were not good enough or inferior or we just had less value. In that. Also acknowledging the pain, the hurt, the abuse that we have to overcome, that we have been affected by that, and that we need to reclaim the fact that we have value and that uh, we should not allow those things to hold us back. Unfortunately, today we still see people dealing with internalized racial oppression. We see people subjected to hegemony, so thinking that they cannot make a contribution or that their contribution is not uh, acceptable. Um, in order to oppress or to regard somebody as inferior, you have to have a very uh, defunct view of who you are and um, it's actually a, a lack of your own humanity if you believe that somebody is not fully human as you are. In order to hurt somebody and to abuse somebody you also have to put aside those deeply inherent human qualities about caring and compassion and in order to uh, continue that oppression um, you have to certainly put that aside. One thing I have been working on over the past few years is also dealing with trauma. Um, but when I think about um, trauma I also think about the bystander the bystander is also traumatized. So what did it mean for people watching the civil rights marches and watching people getting shot and tear gassed and chased down with dogs? What did it mean for those? It also traumatized those people. And so they too need to think about how do they he get healing and how do they overcome that trauma. So the first thing I would say is we need to create the spaces where we can tell our stories, where both the traumatized and those bystanders can tell those stories. I think it was Dr. King that said in one of his uh, eloquent statements was he looks forward to the day uh, when the, slave, the, the, the uh, children of former slaves and former slave owners can sit at the table together. That means dealing with that trauma. That means doing something in order to sit at the table together and if we look at our workplaces today we are still pretty much separated and unfortunately when we are not intentional about that we tend to suppress that generation upon generation and that leads to dysfunction and that leads to pathology and if not dealt with it comes out in ways that we least expect it and maybe in ways that might be much much more complex to deal with so my daily undertaking in my organization is to create more intentionality to create more validity for this kind of uh, discussion and also for people to learn to engage with each other you know everybody talks about diversity, everybody talks about inclusion, but only to a limited point. Um, we are thinking more about authentic engagement and what does that mean? It means accepting each other with all of the baggage and being prepared to work through that so that we can move from what I would call pseudo-community to more authentic community. As a young activist, I was very angry. I was deeply resentful. I saw how my parents had been treated by ordinary people on the street, ordinary privileged white people in South Africa, and I struggled with that. I felt the need to assert myself, and if I needed to use other means, I would get back at them by any means necessary. I've learned great lessons from people like Mahatma Gandhi, who has a great legacy in South Africa, as well as Dr. Martin Luther King, who had the philosophy of nonviolence. And I firmly believe in that. I 
feel deeply within the human spirit is uh, something like compassion, and it is compassion for those in need. And we might not always all have material need. We might have other needs, some psychological needs, a need to, to be loved and to love someone else. And that's what I find we need to develop in our society as we overcome some of these differences. Of course, the first layer that people always uh, resort to is anger, when we think about the stages of grief, you know, when we're confronted with a very stark reality, we have to allow people to get through that so that the real work can actually happen. And that's what I do on a daily basis um, as a practitioner in my organization. Raise awareness and secondly, challenge people to action and a much deeper action. And I've talked a lot about individual action. I'm a firm believer also in collective action. So um, I want to introduce our panels to you, even though they've been stars on the on the screen, and uh, and then I, I'm going to just kick off the panel with a couple of questions for you guys to respond to, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, so we're going to start here with um, the Reverend uh, Dr. Tim Johnson, who's the pastor at Cherokee Park United Church. Thank you for being here. Um, Leon Rodriguez, who is the Chief Diversity Officer for uh, the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, is right next to him. Uh, Maria, wonderful Maria, with that performance, Isa, singer, songwriter, MC, instructor, and performing artist. Uh, Elder Atum Azahir, Executive Director of the Cultural Wellness Center, and uh, Commissioner uh, Edward Ellinger with uh, the Department of Health. Um, so that was very inspirational to hear all of you uh, talking about the work that you do. Um, the first question I'd like to start out with is just, what inspires you to, um, as a leader, to continue to be engaged in overcoming racism and working towards achieving racial equity um, in the community? What are there specific things that have influenced your work? Certainly you talked about some of those things um, in the video, but just so that we can hear from you, what keeps you inspired to be engaged? Um, anybody can take this question. The youth. Youth? The, the youth. Um, I feel like working closely with youth throughout the country and hearing the similarities of stories, even though they have different backgrounds or they grow up in a different community, the need and wanting to have equality um, within their circles is what inspires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what keeps me inspired is, is what I heard in those videos. And uh, it's, it's really about community. The the desire of community to really be a healing community, to be a whole community. Uh, when you look at, uh, David Elwood wrote, wrote a, uh, a book called Poor Support, and, then, and he listed all of the things that in American culture uh, separates us and makes us really look individualistic at how we're doing. But he said the one saving grace is community, our desire for community. And then, so I hearken back to our uh, Healthy Minnesota 2020, from what I heard in the stories, I was thinking about our Healthy Minnesota 2020 framework, which looks at what do we want to do to create health? And we start with children, the opportunities for children. It looks at the, the need for equity and eliminating disparities, but it really evolves around the power of community to make that happen. So I think we need to continue to work with our children, to work on health equity, and do it in community. That's what inspires me. Elder mm -hmm. I think the, the thing I said um, in the video that inspires me is actually, uh, once again, my father, my mother, uh, the women who, uh, women and men who've gone before me. And I think I have four sons. I have um, four sons who are black men. And uh, their father and my brother, I have one brother, so being surrounded by men who were suffering the consequences of what the society has, um, has, has really done to them. And only one of them, the, the, the father of my children, really gave in to the rage and attempted to reproduce the rage that he had experienced. Um, and I think seeing the implications of that rage, you know, his attempt to to kill me, most of you know that whole story. And then our sons growing up and trying to recover from this direct 
experience of having been brutalized and uh, made to think they were not human beings. I saw that inside of our home, and I've worked really hard not to allow that to be reproduced on my watch. Mm -hmm. I do not want that reproduced on my watch. I want my sons and the people who come in contact with them, my grandchildren, my granddaughters, I want them to understand that rage and resiliency stand side by side. And it's our job to reproduce the resiliency, to look at it, to teach it, you know, to live it, to wear it in every place. And the only way to do that, as I have understood, is to go back to who was I before I came in contact with white people. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of what inspires me, is to keep reproducing that so that it really does stand as an alternative to the rage um, and the treatment um, that had, of, of, of inhumane treatment that has happened on, mm -hmm. you know, since I've lived. That, that sounds like a lesson in kind of transformation um, of yourself, which is hold on to, um, I think you said it in the video too, which is ho hope and healing and remembering who you are and what you want to stand for, to not reproduce um, what you've experienced is, is a major challenge in terms of being resilient. And I think, um, Reverend Johnson, you also talked in the video about being committed to um, your own learning process and transformation process. Um, so for maybe for um, uh, Leon and for Dr. Johnson, the question that I have for you is, what are the lessons that you've learned along the way in, in your own transformational journey through your institutions or with you that you might share with, um, with the audience that maybe you didn't get a chance to say in the video. So I'll start with Reverend Johnson. Well, there are lots of lessons. I, um, I guess one that I was actually thinking about is uh, in reference to the first question, but relates very much to this question also. Um, and that is the necessity of uh, continuing to find those uh, ways of connecting heart and head. Um, and I, th I think Maria's music uh, does that. Um, uh, the stories that we are lifting up, uh, your story, um, I found to be a very powerful story. It's not surprising that, uh, you know, you told us that it's hard to tell it without feeling emotional. Uh, because, but it's not just the story. It's, it's that story connected to a bigger story. Um, and uh, so um, it seems to me in transformation work, it's always about making that linkage uh, mm -hmm. between those you know, personal stories which are so uh, crucial um, uh, for us in terms of motivation and then a bigger picture. Um, mm -hmm. I think for me, um, we have the ability to come together. We have the ability to do great things. People inspire me. People inspire me because I see a deep sense of creativity in us. And unfortunately, that creativity sometimes is stamped out very early in our socialization. And the lessons I've learned is when you dig a little deeper, when you create the space, people bring out the best. I've been known to cry when four-year-olds at a daycare center are in a skit and they bring out their creativity. It just brings tears to my eyes. My son was about eight years old and he was learning to play the trombone and his arms were not long enough. <laughs> but he was creative and he played in that school band. And the band didn't sound, you know, as well as it could. <laughs> But those kids were trying. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why I work in higher education, because people come there to be better, to learn more, to work harder. And I just take great joy when I see the end product, when I meet them in the street and they tell me where they're working and what contribution they're making. And I try to attend the award ceremonies when they are honored. That really inspires me. And that is the, some of the lessons that I've learned is let's show up. Mm. If we look in the room today, who's here and who's not here, I can think of at least 25 people that I wish were here. Mm -hmm. And it makes me uncomfortable that I didn't do enough. 
to make sure those 25 were here today. Let's create the space to be creative and let's create the space to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So um, one, of the, one of the things I reflect on a lot um, at Wilder, but just work in the community is, when transformation is happening, what does it look like? Um, what does it look like? Uh, so, you know, um, one of the things that it looks like to me at the Wilder Foundation is that it's not just uh, people of color who are actually talking about race and racism. And, uh, it's, and uh, that, at least from my view, white people see themselves as a part of eliminating racism, that they're part of the racial equation. What does transformation look like you for you in terms of cultivating transformation, overcoming racism? What have you seen in the community and what does it look like? What does it feel like too? Um, so why don't we start out at the, at the end, uh, Commissioner Ellinger? When I, when I see the change that's occurring in the narrative about what creates health, I see transformation. Mm -hmm. When we start talking about uh, the fact that it's community, it's relationships, it's the power structure, it's policies and systems that really create change, when people start thinking differently about, about what uh, health is in, in my world, that it's not about just about individual choice or about medical care, it's really about the policies and the systems and the structure and, and the power. Uh, when I see that change in the narrative, that I see as transformational because it transforms who's part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. It also transforms uh, thinking about who has power. So as Leon said, who's in the room, but who's in the room, who's around the decision-making tables, who gets to make the decisions, who sets the agenda, who holds people accountable. That's all part of the narrative that I see changing. I think that's transformative. And as I go around the state, I, I hear those things, I see those things, and I, I'm really encouraged that the community is ready for that transformational change that began with a change of the narrative. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I'll do it too. I think, I think um, once again, I, I, on my way here this morning, I got a phone call from someone who was um, uh, going into, who is in, in the hospital and at the end of life. And the children have to now make the decision to disconnect, you know, and the, her words were have to pull the plug. And um, she was really struggling with the fact that she could not be with this group of children in her family who had to, quote unquote, pull the plug. So f f what, what I saw her, what I heard from her, and what I hear from her relative to the children, is the children were not um, uh, blaming anybody for the death. Uh, the children were not uh, feeling so totally overwhelmed and paralyzed with thinking about death that they were going to uh, be uh, disruptive and chaotic, because we see that often. Uh, but the children were saying, um, he, I will see him again, that he, he's not gone. He is going to be with me as an ancestor. He can continue to direct me and guide me so I don't have to feel like I'm alone. So transformation is uh, recognizing life at all ends of the cycle and seeing it play out in your decisions, particularly those decisions that have to do with death because the fear of death seems to really be so pervasive around us because we experience so much. So I see it in the decisions that are made and the way people get together and celebrate life even if death is present. Uh, children are referring to ancestors without feeling like it's some kind of uh, voodoo or something, you know. Mm -hmm. That people are really, uh, transformation starts to show up in energetic and again, direct and concrete ways of how we deal with our own pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And I, I really feel that that gives me uh, um, it gives me energy to continue to do this work because otherwise transformation is invisible. Mm. Maria, what does transformation look like to you? There's a lot, there's a lot of different ways I can, I can uh, describe transformation. And I'll give an idea since most recently. Um, last night over dinner, I had dinner with a group of white women and there was about three women of color. 
and the discussion that was held um, by a, the white woman whose home we were in was based on how asking us women of color how they could help and learning how to use the elements of hip hop to reach youth and how they can build using those tools and recognizing the history of where it's came from to help build the transformation, not incarceration with our youth and changing the statistics of how our young men and how our young women of color think. And, um, and, and that right there was a transformation. I grew up in Minnesota with the Minnesota niceness and I'm sure all of us here are familiar of it. It's not so nice, right? Um, <laughs> um, and growing up in high school, when I, I was one of the only people of color in the high school that I attended, and it was basically our lunchroom table was like the UN, we called it. Um, uh, the four food groups, as I've, I've been told by my mom, right? Um, and if we were to discuss anything that had to do with race or how we felt of people of color, Right away, it was like, change the subject, and you'd see those white women run away. The fact that these white women were conducting the dialogue, that was a big transformation right there for me. And for me to not ignore and say, okay, what, what, do, you, what do you guys think you know? you know? No, it was about, yes, let's listen, let's hear each other out, and let's, let's, do, the, let's, check, let's do the checks and balances of everything out. That's a transformation. Mm -hmm. And them recognizing that they are needed because they're the majority in the state. We have 85% of, peop uh, of people in Minnesota and the population are white people still. And they, have, they are in positions of leadership. And like you said, we can't ignore that. We have to discuss how we can knock down those barriers and overcome those barriers and, um, and, and see where our leadership is needed and where their leadership is needed. It's not slicing them out of the picture. It's encouraging that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Leanne, how do you see transformation? What do you, what do you experience when transformation is actually occurring? Well, I see transformation as ongoing. I don't see it necessarily just as an end product, but of course it's great if we get to the end product. It's more the journey. Um, I grew up in a country that was highly segregated and severely oppressive. And a few years ago, I traveled back to South Africa with a delegation from the University of Minnesota. And I hadn't been home in a few years. And so I was also anxious to see the kind of transformations that could have occurred in a society where uh, people were too ashamed to acknowledge their own history or to dress in, in a way that might not attract attention or uh, demure from, from others. We were very, very Eurocentric, and so if you were dressed like I am today, you felt at least I would be accepted. But if you dressed in a more traditional way, um, you might attract way too much attention, and uh, we were very concerned about that. And when I went to this conference with, with folks from the U, um, we went out one evening, um, and I was just stunned and amazed that the food that was presented was the food I loved very much. This is in a restaurant. Uh, the food was just the food that was real comfort food to me. And the restaurant was filled with people of different races. And then a, a band came on, and the music was music that I had no, I, I didn't think anybody would appreciate the kind of music. And then people started dancing, and these were people, white South Africans and black South Africans and Indian South Africans, and they were all dancing to this music. Yet, we were always so ashamed of that music. The music was relegated to some of our own radio stations, which often um, were underfunded, or radio stations which could not um, broadcast that kind of music to a very wide radius. And yeah, people were dancing that, and people were dancing with each other. That to me was transformation um, in South Africa. I think transformation has to do also with accepting ourselves. Transformation has to do with overcoming some of the historical trappings that we've experienced. And being able to reclaim that, that to me is, is transformation. And I see it all the time when I go to campuses and I see students expressing themselves, expressing their culture, 
um, expressing things which may remain hidden or which might be subjugated, particularly in the presence of a dominant culture. To me, that is transformation. I live for the day when we probably all can say we love music from a different genre or music from a different culture or artwork or maybe the way somebody dresses. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Reverend Johnson, what does transformation look like to you? Transformation, uh, among the things that transformation does, I think, is create uh, safe places, safe spaces where people can speak honestly and truthfully. Um, I think that really a, can often be a very hard thing to do, especially around issues of race. Uh, and among the things that one needs to be able to speak honestly and truthfully about, especially if you're white, is whiteness. Um, I think as white people, uh, we need to be able to name that reality. Um, uh, so in our church, for example, we have kind of at the center of our uh, sanctuary uh, a um, stained glass image of Jesus uh, that's white. And um, it's unlikely that uh, the human Jesus was white. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it looks sort of Scottish. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, we've uh, begun just naming that reality. Um, we had a year long conversation about our white Jesus and what that means for a congregation committed to anti racism. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in all honesty, that's an uncomfortable just naming of that reality. I preached several sermons about white Jesus and, um, and I got some feedback that it wasn't welcome. Uh, it was welcomed by a number of folks, but you know, it, it, at least that it made people uncomfortable. And what was uncomfortable about it was, I think, the naming of the whiteness. Um, and I, you know, I guess I've come to find that uh, to be a really kind of an odd reality uh, when one looks at kind of the history of the use of whiteness so that when we move into, the, you know, the, uh, where we are today, suddenly that language is off the table when for hundreds of years whiteness was used very explicitly uh, to privilege uh, one group of people. But now, you know, we're not supposed to talk about it. Um, uh, anyway, to be able to create a place where we can have those kinds of honest conversations without falling into the trap of guilt and shame, because I absolutely agree that's a self-serving, um, useless emotion if one stays there. If it kind of pokes you to think a little more deeply, great. But uh, if you stay there, it's absolutely unhelpful. So to be able to create those kind of spaces and places, that's, transformation looks like that. It begins to manifest itself in other ways in which uh, the kind of music that you have, the kind of art that you draw upon, these are resources that um, can not only add to transformation but reflective of transformation. Uh, who, is in, uh, who is being welcomed in, and included into the community? All those are, uh, I think, manifestations of transformation. That's wonderful. Um, so I think we've learned a lot, actually, from our panelists from watching the videos. I, I don't know what you got out of it, but um, I just thought I'd do a quick summary of the things I heard that I think are pretty special. The first is that um, to truly cultivate transformation, identifying and naming what's present um, in terms of the distortion of reality, in terms of how things actually exist um, in the world with you know, sometimes even a fact base can be helpful, that hope and healing uh, intergenerationally so that trauma isn't reproduced into uh, future generations um, is very important, that when the bonds of community uh, are strengthened because of the type of dialogues, music, how we question and are with each other, that, that that's transformative, and that the uh, asking of questions from the dominant culture to uh, people who are not a part of that community can be transformative because so often it's the other way around. 
and there's a healing aspect of, of doing that that's, that's very helpful. Um, and finally, you know, I think what I heard is that uh, we all bring our own self-imposed limitations um, from our own experience with race to every single interaction and that um, we need to actually come together to have uh, authentic dialogue and also leadership together so that we can overcome racism to be truly transformative um, in our institutions and in the community. So we're at uh, 12, 11.45. Do, do we have questions? We, do we have time for questions? Okay. Okay, we're going to take a few minutes for questions, and the moderator, the, the real moderators are going to tell me when we need to stop. So any questions that, that you have for the panelists? Hello. Um, thank you all for being here today. My name is Hamza Mose, and I'm a student at the University of Minnesota. I wanted to um, ask a question. Tim Johnson basically solidified it when he said uh, that naming the reality is a critical component of seeing transformation. And so is there anything special about Minnesota when it comes to that? Um, <laughs> because it seems um, that, for me, my experience at the University of Minnesota, the first thing that happens when you know, I ever name a reality when it comes to race relations or the disparities that we have here. Um, everyone's eyes glaze over and it's like, oh my goodness, here he goes, you know? And so uh, my question basically is, how can you get through that without being labeled, without being judged, and without basically being marginalized for the fact that you brought that up? Who would like to take that? on our panel. Leon? <laughs> well, I think you, you're talking about some of our cultural realities because we don't engage with each other on a broad range of issues. And unfortunately, when we talk about those cultural and racial realities, they are non-normative. It is time for us to make those part of the norm because this is our experience. This is our collective experience. I, I sat in your shoes uh, and still do, um, but let's not be also a one issue activist. Let's think about a broad range of things that we can approach. Sometimes because it's non-normative, people go into shock when, when you raise that. And I, I like Tim's um, reference to guilt. I think guilt is a good thing but guilt should not become something that leads to inaction. And unfortunately, when you do raise those issues, um, one of the reactions people have could be guilt. The other is um, a lack of emotional maturity. When race becomes a topic of conversation, some people just have, don't have the emotional capacity to engage in that conversation. We don't have all the solutions, but certainly if we had the emotional capacity, we could stay at the table and we can stay in the game and we can certainly discuss whatever we feel we still need to achieve. I'll take uh, one more question and uh, then we'll have to move on. So I see a hand right over here that I can't quite get to. So if, you, if someone could just... Uh, the, Where is it? I've got someone on this side. Yep, so the, the gentleman in the beard. My name is Mohammed. I work at the uh, Kendira County Family Service. I'm sorry, that was my previous em employer. <laughs> <laughs> now I work at Ramsey County as a financial worker, so. Um, I just have a question for the, um, our commissioner. You said when um, others are toward, you know, when you work towards transform, transformative ways through experience, I know, I think we all know that we have motivation and um, effortless um, um, motivations to do good and, and, and this work in, in overcoming racism. But what keeps you, my question is, what keeps you going and what motivates you and what keeps you, um, Alert all, alert all the time. Well, let me, let me I want to respond to that first question, and then I'll get back, back to you, because it's, it's related. The reason Minnesota is healthy is because of the investments that were made 30 or 40 years ago in the public good. And Minnesota has really, historically, as a collective spirit, and we've invested in the public good. We've invested in the commons, and it's that commons that, has, that makes us healthy. It's our communities that make us healthy. 
Uh, now, as we become increasingly diverse, I moved to Minnesota in 1980, and we had 2% people of color and American Indians at that point. We're now 17% increasing rapidly. 34% of second graders are kids of color and American Indians. All of a sudden, our commons is different. And I talked about the narrative that I'm seeing, that people are starting to redefine the commons. They're starting to think about the, the public good and how we invest in that. Uh, and so what keeps me engaged is as I'm seeing the energy that's in communities coming forward to say we want to invest in different ways. And I see them supporting the things that we're doing at the health department, uh, saying you're on the right track with the statewide health improvement program, for example, which gives power to the communities to decide how to do that with community leadership teams. They're coming to the legislature as a community to say we want the health department to do this. And, and they're getting, to get out, getting us to do what we want to do. You know, the, the community's coming forward with the power uh, to make change. That really energizes me when I see that. I always tell people that, that you as a community have a lot more power with the legislature and Governor Dayton than I do because you come with a, with a power and a passion and the actual stories about what creates health. We're glad to partner with you in that. That's, that's what energizes me on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, oh, we're Sue's telling me we're out of time, so why don't we have oh. Elder Toom talk and then we'll we'll wrap up. Okay. okay. I just want to say that uh, one of the things years ago that I read that always stays with me too is that um, a writer named Neely Fuller said, "If you do not understand white supremacy and racism, uh, what it is, how it works, that everything else that you understand will confuse you." And so on a day-by-day -day basis, you know, I recognize that the experiences that I'm going to have will come from um, that kind of uh, place, from a white supremacy place, even in Minnesota. And so what I have to do is look at what is the alternative to that, as I said, and then try my best to have that be a cross-generation. So what do I talk with? How do I share that, especially with young black people who really at this point in time are surprised often by the way they're treated in different institutions. And so we want to institutionalize this idea that we are in charge of our own destiny and that we can change even that which seems unchangeable. Wonderful. I'd just like to thank our distinguished panelists. Um, it's been a pleasure to listen to you.